Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Mercatus Podcast, Digital Grocer. I'm your host, Sylvain Perrier, President and CEO of Mercatus Technologies, and joining me remotely today from his dingy basement is Mark Fairhurst, <laughs> not our Senior Director of Marketing, because Mark was promoted to Vice President of Marketing. Thank you, Mark, for joining me. Maybe I can get out of the dingy basement now. <laughs> I don't know, dude. <laughs> and it's not episode 36. I think I've incremented by plus two for some reason. It's... <laughs> We're doing a lot of these. We're doing a lot doing of these. Lot. We're doing yeah. a lot. And, you know, it's, it's good. and we continue to practice our physical distancing, not our social yes. distancing. And it's uh, yeah. it's Friday here in Toronto. Spring is slowly settling in. We're getting in the, well, let me look at my watch here. It's three degrees Celsius, the devil's tool, the metric system. And uh, that's more closer to almost 40 um, if you're using the imperial system. So we're happy it's starting to warm up. You know, normally when that happens here in the city, the sidewalks start to get busy and it's, you know, unfortunately that's not the case with the uh, pandemic. Fortunately, people are heeding the public health advice and, and staying off the street. Yeah. And, you know, we appreciate that. And, and thank you for those of you that are doing that. But, you know, we're all in this together and we're making the best of it. Kind of the strange thing, you know, through this pandemic is likely what we're going to see is these we like to call here at Mercatus is the middle of the line retailers that have actually no sort of brand differentiation are probably going to collapse and not come back. Wow, that's a statement. Yeah, and what, you're, you're probably right. Yeah, and Mark, you and I have talked about this on more than one occasion when we were you know chatting about when the economical crisis hit in 08, 09, how some retailers literally lost their customers because they couldn't afford to either shop there. So they traded down. <laughs> and yep. when the economy bounced back, some of them, you know, some of the customers traded back up. But I think the reality is at the state that we're in today, any form of trading co-op dollars, I don't care what it is, you know, trying to borrow against your assets, you know, when there's almost no liquidity in the marketplace, it's not going to help you. You know, I'm thinking Macy's, J.C. Penny, maybe. J.C. Penny had a pretty high-profile departure. Sean Gench, who used to be the CMO over at Sprouts Farmers Market, and Sean's an amazingly smart individual. Yeah. You know, and I think when it comes to grocery, you know, it could be the same. We've heard the unfortunate rumors that are circulating in the industry today. If we don't really quash that curve anytime soon that some governors are actually prepared to close grocery stores and only let them be open if they can do click and collect and delivery. Yeah. And so you have a string of independents who may or may not have that service or who may be dependent on a third party marketplace solution. And if they can't get people to come in and do any form of work because they have zero medical coverage. Because they're so dependent on the gig economy in order to yeah. make that happen. Yeah, and this could be a problem for some of these retailers, and it would be sad because, you know, you have people that have invested their life savings. You have, these are second, third, fourth generation businesses where the wealth is tied up in these properties. You know, some unfortunate things kind of happen. But, you know, nonetheless, there are some retailers that are out there that have just really carved a strong niche for themselves in terms of a, not just a brand experience, but really capturing the hearts and the minds of their shoppers. You know, I'm thinking... Farm Boy here in Canada, around the capital area, which Sobeys bought not long ago, Sprouts Farmers Market, and then kind of the darling right now on Wall Street, and we know a few people over there, Layla Kasha, who's the uh, SVP of Marketing, Grocery Outlet. Yeah. We've done quite well. I mean, you buy stuff there at Grocery Outlet that's 40% less expensive than anywhere else. Yeah. And if you think about parallels with the 2008 recession, Mm -hmm. which retailers are going to be doing well coming out of the economic downturn. Well, the big ones will. Yeah. I mean, if you think yeah. Kroger will do well, Walmart will be fine. I mean, it's also, I think there's not just the economical aspect of what's happening right now, but if you as a retailer take an approach where you care and you're being authentic with your shoppers and you're worried about them and you're trying to help them, I think shoppers will reward that brand all day long. Mm -hmm. But I think if you get into, and I've seen this in some of our provinces here in Canada, where they're taking advantage of them. God bless you because I'm afraid for your brand when all this uh, bounces back. 
It'll be interesting. But, you know, part of what we do here at Mercatus is, you know, Mark and I and the entire senior leadership team, we try to impart this down to the, the team. You know, there's 92 of us now is be a lifelong learner. And we consume a voracious amount of content. I know Mark, you do. I do. Kevin Kidd, our VP of product does as well. And we read these publications and we read books. And a lot of it is to leverage not only for our own benefit, but to educate our audience and inform our very own research. Now, thanks to Jeff Kettner. Yep. Kettner is our PR firm. Yep. One Three book. Years now. How many years now? Three years. Three years. Austin, yeah. And they, year them, yeah. Yeah. Out of Austin, Texas. An amazing book came across my desk about two weeks ago. And it's an advanced copy, and it's written by Steve Dennis, and it's titled Remarkable Retail, How to Win and Keep Customers in the Age of Digital Disruption. Now, I'm blown away by this book. And why? Well, because it's actually written by someone who's been in the trenches. He gets it, and the book is raw and honest. He doesn't pull any punches. And quite frankly, this book should be an essential survival guide for any retail executive. You know how, how we all talk about, I know we do in the tech space, but we talk about our toolkit. Yeah. You know, we'll have, hey, if I need an ops guy, call this person. If I need a marketing person, call this individual. I have this templated NDA. I have this, I have this, I have this. This should be the same thing. If you're the CMO, if you're the VP of digital, if you're an e-commerce director or so on, this should be your book that's on your desk where you're making reference to. The so detail I, Bible. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm not sure if I'll get on, on my knees for it, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's Friday, folks, and it's Toronto. Like, It's been a long week. I like this book so much that the author, Steve Dennis, is on the phone with us today to talk about to talk about his book that's actually going to be released on April 14th. Now, so for those of you who don't know Steve, he's a consultant. He's a keynote speaker and author focused on retail growth and innovation. He has been named a top a global retail influencer by multiple organizations, and his thoughts on the future of shopping are regularly shared in his role as a Forbes senior contributor, which is true because I've read some of it. Now, he's had a 30-year career as senior executive at two Fortune 500 retailers and more recently as a strategic advisor. Steve's worked with a dozen retail, consumer, luxury, and social impact brands to inspire, catalyze, and design their journey to remarkable results. He's delivered talks on six continents, sharing his unique perspective on what it takes to reignite customer growth in a world of constant change and shifting consumer preferences. And that is for sure in the last 18 months, if not in the last six months. He's contributed commentary to Bloomberg, Business Week, the BBC, CNBC, CNN, the Harvard Business Review, and the Wall Street Journal, among many others. I did speak to my brother who works at Bloomberg, and for sure he's come across some of Steve's stuff. Steve is currently the president of Sageberry Consulting, and prior to founding Sageberry, he was the chief strategy officer and SVP multi-channel marketing for Neiman Marcus Group. Steve, welcome to our podcast. Well, thank you, and thank you for those very, very kind words. You're more than I'm welcome. I'm blushing. I'm blushing. Great. So, Steve, can you share with us the overall premise of your book? Well, when I started it, the original premise was this idea that thought physical retail isn't dead. It's really more that boring retail is. And then it kind of morphed from there to really be about how, and I think by now maybe this is becoming obvious, that you just can't get away with being good enough for a slightly better version of mediocre anymore, mm -hmm. that you really have to be remarkable to have any chance of survival, and which I think is being made even more clear by what we're going through right now. Yeah, absolutely. and. First of all, you've intentionally split the book into two parts, which is brilliant. You know, when I was reading, I feel it gives the readers this kind of sense of context and application. Mm -hmm. And in the first part, you titled it Shift Happens. And you talk about this profound, you know, systematic shift that is currently happening. Can you share with us what this revolution is? Sure. Well, I think there are a couple components. I think the broadest one is if you think about the way things were 10, 15 years ago, a lot of retail models and frankly, a lot of businesses were really built on scarcity. There wasn't 
great access to distribution, to products, to information, to pricing, to reviews, you know, all, all these things that allowed basically the brand or the retailer to be in control and the customer to be in a little bit of a weakened position and just have to select from a relatively narrow set of choices, which, you know, if you lived in a big city, that wasn't necessarily a huge compromise. But, you know, the internet has just created this world of abundance, you know, abundance product choice, abundance of information. And so if you're just good enough or even pretty good, you oftentimes are, are really an also ran. So I think, I think digital technology just fundamentally shifted the basis of competition. And now we're in this you know, kind of everything now world where the customer is much more in charge and it just shifts the, the balance of power. So there's, and I'm sure you hear this as much as we do, you know, there's these so-called retail pundits that are out there and they talk about the retail apocalypse, you know, and specifically they're citing brick and mortar. And every time there's someone reducing the number of brick and mortar locations they have, or, you know, somebody's going to shut down, they seem to rematerialize or if we're coming up on the holiday season. Christmas and New Year's and then somebody's going to make the bull predictions for the next year and then somebody brings up the whole notion of the apocalypse. What's your opinion on these comments? Well, so one of the chapters I have in the first part is called the future will not be evenly distributed. And I think, you know, one one of the points is that it's really, I guess, more uh, attention getting to make these broad pronouncements. But I think if you look at what's going on in retail broadly, physical retail is still by far the majority share of how people spend their money. Physical retail, I mean, it remains to be seen how the whole world of retail will, will turn out this year, obviously. But if you look over the past 10 years, physical retail in the US anyway, I think it's pretty much the same in Canada, has been positive. And there are lots of stores that are being open and there are lots of mostly physically based retailers that are doing really well. So I think the general narrative is greatly exaggerated. I think where things are fairly apocalyptic, you know, not talking about the immediate future here, it's really in the middle uh, of retailers. It's the, the retail apocalypse is pretty concentrated among a relatively small number of, of brands, and there's plenty that are doing really well. So one of the challenges, I think, that companies in the same space as ours here at Mercatus is that not every grocery retailer treats e-commerce as part of the overall business. Right. And it kind of sits off to the wayside. They give it some resources and not even the same, no merchants, not even conversations with the core merchandising team. We try to do our best to kind of get them to think strategically in terms of, you know, it has to be conceptually one business. Exactly. So why do you think retailers are in, maybe not just in food, maybe that's happening in the other parts of the retail vertical, but why is that? Why are they so fixated as treating it as separate? Well, in my experience, having worked for a couple of retailers that really struggled to get to see the channels as really one thing and some clients, I think a lot of it stems from most of the retail leaders have come up in a largely brick and mortar world and they established a lot of the way they measure things uh, as being very channel centric. And when brick and mortar is your dominant channel, whether that's grocery or whether that's department stores, you tend to then bolt things on. And I think what happened with a lot of retailers over the past 10 years is they basically added e-commerce as a separate thing and thought about it as a separate investment channel oftentimes with its own P&L and own staff and, and so forth. And, you know, even if they invested aggressively behind it, which I agree with you, a lot of grocers didn't. Um, but if you look at other channels, there was aggressive investment behind e-commerce, but it was really thought about as a separate, a separate channel. And, you know, that's just not the way customers behave. It's actually true. And I'm not so sure for groceries specifically, but Forrester did some research a couple of years ago, which showed that digital channels actually drive three times as many brick and mortar sales as they do sales that are transacted in the online channel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you just really have to think as digital as a way to engage with the customer and 
Some customers will choose to transact online. Some customers will use the digital channel to inform uh, which stores they choose to go to, whether they buy online, pick up in the store. And it's, it's not this whole separate way of thinking has really caused a lot of problems for a lot of retailers. I agree. There's this symbiotic relationship. And again, I'm, I'm just pontificating from our own experience here that there's this symbiotic relationship that exists between your digital channels and your brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and the Forrester research is bang on, even with our own personalization engine that we use to send, you know, fairly unique content to individual shoppers. We don't necessarily see the conversion occur online. Exactly. Right. There are still consumers that are very exploratory and the way they do things psychologically, they want to go touch a product. They want to go see it. Absolutely. Yeah. You sure. know, they're not necessarily destination shoppers. And I don't think everything's been fully commoditized yet in the space of grocery, but I think that's rapidly approaching. So there is a symbiotic relationship. So I think, you know, and I think you talk well about this in the book that at the end of the day, if you're a pure play dot com, and we see that with, you know, shoe vendors, you know, dress shirts for men, whatever, that eventually they come around to the brick and mortar world. Yeah, in most cases, I mean, I've been I've been saying for a while that, and I'm certainly not the only one, that I think there really is not going to be, for all intents and purposes, such a thing as pure play e-commerce in the future. I mean, first of all, even Amazon has something like $16 billion in brick and mortar sales right. right now. So they're already bigger than a huge number of retailers in North America and around the world. But there are clearly, in a, one of the things I talk about in the book is the difference between buying and shopping. And I think that you can think about buying as more task and mission oriented and e-commerce is really good at that. If you basically know what you want, you don't need to touch and feel it. You're really just trying to be efficient and getting something off your to-do list. A lot of e-commerce works really, really well, and you don't necessarily need a a brick and mortar presence to make that happen. But shopping is inherently more experiential and that's what brick and mortar really, really excels at. But you're right. I mean, very few customers are purely channel specific in their behavior. Digital drives physical, physical drives digital. There's a ton of research that supports that now. I just think it's really sad because back when I was at Neiman Marcus and we were doing a lot of this work in 2007, 2008, we were already seeing this behavior be a significant phenomenon. And, you know, a lot of people thought that luxury retail would be slow to see this because, you know, you're selling very expensive stuff with a commission sales force. And you'd think, well, people really want to try it on and get that direct interaction. And that was true, but they were starting their journey in a digital channel often and then going into the store. So the channel centric thinking will really cause you to make a lot of mistakes. I think. Does that not feed into your thesis that the customer is the channel? I mean, I'm hard pressed to come up with many places where it's not, I mean, this seems like such a cliche, but you know, we talk about channel centricity and I think if you were really starting your customer experience strategy with the customer, you would be really dissecting the different sort of customers you serve and the different sort of purchase occasions you are focused on and you would understand those customer journeys really well and you would design your experience to fit that and i think if you did that i mean every time i've ever done that you almost never see customers that have this channel centric behavior so i think just from a, as a matter of strategy you should start with the customer and think about it as all being one channel. But I think, you know, particularly with mobile devices now, you know, I say in the book, the best location is really wherever your customer happens to be with their smart device, right? Right. I mean, you can go from, it used to be, you know, just kind of going back to the shift happens question you started with, you know, even seven, eight years ago, for the most part, if you were going online, that was a pretty intentional act that you were doing from your home or office or maybe a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. But since smartphones became widely adopted and obviously other technology followed along, customers can be shopping whenever they want. You know, it's the second that it dawns on them standing in line or, or waiting for the traffic light or whatever, it's not necessarily the, the most healthy thing, but um, you know, they can be online shopping and you know, maybe that's determining a 
product they're going to put in their shopping cart and buy later, or it could be, oh, which store is closest to me to buy this thing I forgot to pick up. And so it just really blends the distinction between the channels. And, and that's why I talk about fundamentally the strategy of embracing the blur, because I think the shopping lines have been blur for a while and they're just becoming more and more blurred. And it's interest, interesting that you say that because when I look at the retail landscape right now and I think of the proliferation of you know smartphone applications and kind of with the backdrop of the philosophical elements that you mentioned and the, at the end of the day, serve your customers where they are regardless of what time of day. You know, there's these business models that are coming out that are just, I can't wrap my head around them how they make money. <laughs> because they don't yeah and i'm pretty good you know because my first degree was in accounting and so i can really run some ratios fairly quick so i look at some of these things and some of these pre-ipos or these perspectives and i'm like how, how does this stand up is this just a cash grab for wall street explain to our listeners your section on the warby parker of whatever First of all, I should be clear that I like Warby Parker. I'm a good customer. I think they're probably one of the few so-called digitally native vertical brands that I think are likely to be enduring. But, you know, one of the things that happened, I don't know, about 10 years ago probably was this whole idea that you could build powerful brands without these pesky things we call stores. Mm -hmm. you know, that if you could avoid the rent and the inventory and all the complexity of operating brick and mortar stores, you could just have this amazingly scalable business. And a lot of people, I think, heard Mark Andreessen's comment that software eats retail and his prediction that there will be no physical retail in the future, which I think as much as Mark Andreessen is a super smart, successful guy, I think uh, very soon he will, that will look at to be one of the most foolish statements made in recent times. But anyway, venture capitalists got behind quite a lot of these, these models that were basically premised on building great consumer brands without any physical assets to speak of. And so venture capital piled in a number of these companies, Warby Parker, Bonobos, Untucket, Wayfair, et cetera, raised a lot of capital. And then that started kind of the second tier of folks following behind them, seeing what was going on to try to build brands in a similar fashion and basically doing some version of, you know, disrupting a particular category with innovative product design, cheaper prices, great customer service. But along the way, it seems that many of them forgot that they eventually have to make money. And I think what we're, we've been starting to see, even before we got into the whole COVID-19 crisis, is that many of these market segments are not big enough to support an online only model. So most of them are getting into physical stores rather ironically. The cost of customer acquisition online has gotten, as you guys well know, just crazy expensive. And many of these brands have pretty high product returns. And so, you know, they've just basically have built these profit proof models, you know, been setting fire to big piles of cash for the last few years. I think it's be even pre the COVID-19 crisis, I think it was becoming increasingly obvious that many of these brands had no chance of being as big, at least as the venture capitals hoped they would be. And I think now, you know, it's gonna be harder for them to raise capital, presumably. And, you know, they're obviously taking at least a short-term hit from the pandemic. Do you think Instacart is one of those? You know, I don't know as much about Instacart in particular, but I think home delivery is a really, I've worked in a couple of times in, in home delivery and home delivery is just really, really challenging to make happen. So I suspect they're gonna be pretty stressed throughout this. And you know, Amazon obviously is the best at home delivery, but they're having a hard time getting the economics to work yeah. as well. So I'm pretty skeptical, not that these are all gonna go away, but I think there's gonna be a, a real reset on the valuation and, and consolidation. Yeah. Whether that'll specifically hit Instacart, I'm not sure. It's interesting you mentioned Amazon, because. You can't Amazon out Amazon, right? And if you look at their numbers, it's in your book, quite frankly, I think, because I'm not going to make this up. I think it's 27% their cost of goods sold is tied to fulfillment and delivery. I think it's actually a little higher. I think when, I don't know that they've, well, we'll see what the most recent numbers look like, but that I think they were trending upwards and that's where it was, I think, 
at the end of 2018 or early 2019. Yeah, and when if you look at it and you try to transpose that over to grocery where it's not as efficient as an Amazon, I mean, it's tough to say if any company making doing pure delivery play is going to be super profitable. In the second part of your book, this is really where the rubber meets the road and you have this eight-step program. It's not like a 12-step program, but <laughs> it gets you where you need to go as a retailer and it's sobering advice, right? Because you're setting up the landscape. You're saying, hey, historically this, here's where the mistakes have been. Here's what you need to be worried about, blah, 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 on the first part. Then you start to kind of explain to them, here's the eight steps. Mm -hmm. And can retailers dig themselves out of the hole? Well, I hate to give you the it depends answer, but I think that unfortunately many retailers have dug such a big hole that I think it is going to be extremely difficult. Um, I wrote a piece for Forbes a couple of weeks ago, I think it was, where you know, I talked about the collapse of the middle and I said that the coronavirus is going to just accelerate further the collapse of the middle. So these retailers that don't have a remarkable value proposition and have terrible liquidity or, or capital structures, I don't think many of them are going to be able to, to recover. But I think for the most part, COVID-19 is somewhat just accelerating the inevitable. Mm -hmm. But I think there are plenty of retailers if, if they've got at least a solid market position and they've got some of the ability to actually fund innovation, absolutely. I think, you know, Best Buy to me is a great example of a company that two, three years ago, a lot of people thought was going to get Amazon or whatever term you want to use. Yep. And, you know, it's a very mature business model. So I don't think they're going to you know, just light up their growth or, or profitability. But when they rethought their business model and developed what I call more harmonized strategy, so, so not getting so caught up in the, the separate channel dynamics and understanding what digital is good at and what physical retail is good at and blending them. No, they've really resurrected themselves. So it, it can be done, absolutely. Yeah, I worked for I worked for Best Buy in the early 2000s on their psychometric analysis when they were trying to design their stores. Yeah. And I got to work with the team at Best Buy Canada out of Vancouver and then the team in Minneapolis and then traveling to the major urban centers. And it was great because they were extremely data-oriented and leveraging real-time metrics to say, hey, this store in Fairfax, Virginia, this yeah. is the products we're going to sell, and here's how we're going to merchandise this store. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you push past 2010, and you kind of felt, whoa, these guys are losing their way. Well, I think that's actually a great example. I, I spent a little bit of time, when I was at Neiman Marcus, we spent some time with, with the Best Buy folks, and I think they were really on to, frankly, a lot of the themes that I talk about in the book, personalization, harmonized mm -hmm. channel, treat different customers differently, et cetera. And then I do think that they basically decided to try to out Amazon, Amazon, mm -hmm. and they lost their way for a few years. And they basically got themselves in, into more or less a race to the bottom. I think I quote my friend Seth in the book, he said, you know, the problem with a, with a race to the bottom is you might win or worse finish second. Right. And you know, they, they finished second. And, um, but, you know, I think they realized, you know, they had to go through some leadership changes to make it happen. But I think, you know, they really did reframe their strategy and, you know, been able to get their growth do you reignited, I guess. Do you think a Macy's will bounce back? I've been very critical of Macy's and I think that they are counting on some incremental improvements being the thing that keeps them relevant. And I don't think they're doing enough to stay relevant, but I will say, I think they're a little bit better positioned than say a JCPenney is. So they may benefit from being kind of the last man standing in that moderate department store space. Cause I do think there is still certainly demand for that kind of store. It just continues to contract. And so, I think they'll probably be around in a smaller form, but I, I definitely don't think it's a foregone conclusion that they'll make it. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I don't know. I, I mean, if, I think you're right on JC Penny, you know, losing Sean and him migrating somewhere else is a big blow to that business and it kind of a telltale sign. So today, you know, amidst the pandemic, you know, what would you advise a retailer who needs to reinvigorate their brand and somehow lead a digital? What would you tell them? The first thing I should say is I, you know, I appreciate that we are in 
unprecedented times and that the vast majority of retailers really have to manage for cash, essentially. So, you know, it's sometimes hard. It's like, uh, I think Mike Tyson supposedly said, you know, everybody has a strategy until you get punched in the face. And, you know, <laughs> so I think it's hard to perhaps think long term and strategically, at least for the immediate future. But one thing I, I like that you said earlier is I think if you can possibly do it, think long term about how you treat your customers, how you treat the people you work with, your vendors, your agencies, your partners, uh, and not be so short term sighted and transactional. I think the long term relationship, the things that are accretive to your brand, I think will serve you well if you can possibly do it. Obviously, you need to keep the lights on. But strategically, my general advice is, and again, it sometimes sounds so trite, but really go deep in understanding your customer. I mean, dissect those customer journeys at you know as detailed a segmentation as you can muster, and by the different types of journeys those customers engage in. Because you know, I think sometimes people try to do like this one size fits all view of the world. And you know, I learned early on when I was in the furniture business a million years ago that. The way people shop for a mattress is really different than the way people shop for a dining room table, right? Even though it's all furniture. Right. And the advice I give in the book is when you dissect those customer journeys, certainly you should look for those pain points or friction points, or I call them discordant notes in the, in the process and root those out. But I think most of the time rooting those out are more to kind of table stakes. You know, if you don't do them, you're behind. Mm -hmm. But then the hard work, I think, is to find those places where you can really, you know, kind of amplify the wow. What's that? What's that thing in the in the customer experience that's intensely customer relevant, is proprietary to your brand, and ideally, which is you know like literally what I mean by remarkable in the book, people will talk about. You know, what are those things that the customer really cares about, but creates a story for them that they will ideally share with others. So you know, easier certainly easier said than done, but I think the deeper you go down on understanding the customer and dissecting the customer journey and the role of digital in those journeys, um, the better off you'll be. Perfect. Well, that's great advice. And Steve, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. How do people get a hold of you? you? Probably the, the best way is to go to my website, which is stephenpdennis.com. So it's Stephen with a B, with a V, sorry, <laughs> Stephen with a V, can't talk today. And P like Peter, Dennis, D-E-N-N-I-S. Perfect. And so the book is coming out on the 14th. And I suspect all the usual channels, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. Yeah, I've been really fortunate that pretty much everybody's carrying it. So yeah, all the all the usual suspects. If you uh, want to support independent bookstores, which are really struggling, there's a great website called bookshop.org, which gives money back to uh to small and independent retailers and there will be an audiobook version also up on the, the major platforms in a few days fantastic thank you and mark how do people get a hold of us regular channel regular way uh, www.mercatus.com and on the podcast page we'll have a link to steven and his profile and where you can get his book thank you folks and we will talk to you soon and uh, keep your ear to the ground for our next episode. Peace.